In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Welcome, my beloved, to our third episode of COA Homily Podcasts. Today, we are going to be speaking about a subject that I believe is extremely important to so many of us. Today, specifically, in a reality and in a world where we have so many questions about who it is that we're supposed to be and who everyone else expects us to be. And at the end, we find ourselves in a situation where we really don't know who we are. And the question of who the human being is has been posed so many times, especially in such a confusing era that we live in today, where everything is expected to um, point towards our identity. Everything is expected to define us in one way or another. So today, the conversations that we're going to be having is going to be focused on knowing God, knowing yourself, and where your identity fits into all of this. So... Hopefully, in having this discussion today, we will be able to, at the very least, have this discussion with the intention of being able to pose the question, who did God intend for the human being to be? We're going to be posing the question, what does it mean for us to be created in God's image and likeness? And how does that say something about my identity? And ultimately, we'll also talk a little bit about the challenges of what it looks like for a Christian today in today's world to be able to make sure that they don't lose their identity. And on the contrary, they're very focused on who it is that God created them to be so that they don't allow anything else to define their identity other than their relationship with their creator, their God, and their savior. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right in. So to know God and know yourself and how to deal with the identity crisis that many of us face in today's broken reality. Let me begin by quoting who I believe to be an incredible theologian of the 20th century, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis says the following, and I think it's really worth taking the time to be able to break this down a little bit and fully understand it. So what does C.S. Lewis say? In God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to yourself. And unless you know God as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. So what does C.S. Lewis say? basically saying here. It's so important for us to understand that the relationship between knowing God and knowing myself is incredibly interrelated. There is something there to be said about how it is that in knowing who I am, I will also discover who God is. And in knowing who God is, this will also give me a standard, a benchmark, if you wish, into understanding who I am. So when we begin to break this down, when we begin to come closer to God and you just realize how great and eternal and as C.S. Lewis says, immeasurably superior God is to myself, I then very quickly realize that the worship of myself, this identity that I've created within me, this idea that everything revolves around me begins to slowly break down. And when you come to this realization, it gives you insight as to who it is you truly are. Now, you might quickly hear this and think to yourself, okay, so here we go. This is going to turn into self-hating Christianity and I, I hate myself and I am worthless and I am lowly and I am nothing. And no, that's not the case. But the case is for you to understand that this immeasurably superior God created you with intention, created you out of love, created you so that you can bear his image. Because in recognizing who this immeasurably superior God is, it will give you insight into his heart and his intention for you. So. What does this mean? In order for us to be able to understand this, I would love for us to be able to reference a person like St. Anthony the Great. St. Anthony says in the 4th century that we are invited to know. And this invitation to know is one that will force us to be able to pose the question, do I truly know who I am? And if I have discovered who I am, what my intention, or what God's intention was when he created me, his purpose behind creating me out of love and out of mercy, and out of truly his goodness only, what does this say about me? And once I realize who I am, this will naturally tell me who God is in the process. So what does St. Anthony say in his third letter? He says, he who knows himself knows God. And he who knows God knows also the dispensations which he makes for his creatures. I, this is so important for us to be able to really unpack and wrap our minds around. If I know who I am, this gives me insight into the very image of the one who I was created after his image. If and I know myself, I can then point back to God and understand who it is that he has created me to be. 
So St. Anthony is inviting us to this, to be able to understand who we are in order for us to then be able to understand who God is. I want to be able to point this back to a very specific passage that the Lord himself says in the Gospels. I'm going to quote here the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 22. And if you remember the context of this passage, basically what's happening is that there's a group of people who want to be able to trap the Lord. And they're tired of the fact that he has uh, so much popularity and and the, the great population of people around him really do believe that he is the Messiah, that he is some sort of very... A righteous prophet who the Lord uh, has sent, and they really believe that this man is sent from God. Now, whether or not people fully understood that he was God in the flesh is not fully revealed at this point, but you can tell that people are really beginning to believe that he is the one that Daniel prophesied about. He is the son of man. And so here, the, the people who stand against the Lord want to trap him. So what do they want to do? They want to set him up against either the great population of the people around him, or they want to set him up to be an enemy of the state. And the best way to do this is to pose a question and to say, tell us, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Now, why is this a loaded question? Because what they're trying to do is to make sure that no matter how the Lord Jesus Christ answers this question, he fails. If he says, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, then they have evidence that he is potentially trying to cause a rebellion, and he's inviting the people to go against the laws of the empire, in which state the, situ- the, the, the entire empire would be against us. And so, in doing this, the Roman soldiers would then have every reason to be able to take him into custody and to put him on trial. And if he says, yes, pay the taxes, well, then you have the issue with the vast majority of the people around him who are suffering at the hands of paying overly, high, overly, um, overly demanding taxes. And, and they're tired of living under the empire, which they believe persecute them. And they want to go back to the glory days of, you know, the people of Israel, those who were under David, the prophet and the king, the great nation of Israel. They want to be independent. They don't want to be under Rome. And so one answer would potentially upset the state and the other answer is going to upset the people. The Lord in his wisdom, he answers this beautifully, of course. You know, him who is wisdom, him who is the Logos of God answers this beautifully. But what does he say? He says, show me the tax money. And so they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And so they brought him a denarius. And you have here on the screen an example of what a denarius would look like. And on every piece of mint, on all of the monetary, uh, all all of the money that was exchanged at the time, you always had the image of the emperor. And so they answered him and they said, Caesar's. So his answer to them is, then render unto Caesar. What is Caesar's? And give to God what is God's. But what is implied here? He is suggesting that what belongs to Caesar has his image engraved on it. And so because Caesar's image is engraved on the denarius, then give the denarius back to the one whose image it bears. But then he says, give unto God what is God's. Now let me ask you the question. Who is it that bears God's image? Is it not the human being? He's saying, in other words, give the money back to Caesar. What God wants is you, the person, the human being, the heart on which I engraved my very own image. And this is so important for us to understand. The Lord is saying, in other words, you are mine because you bear my image. And this brings us all the way back to the book of Genesis. All the way back to understanding what it means for us to be created in God's image and likeness. And when we go back to the book of Genesis, we discover that while some people attempt to be able to dissect the book of Genesis, especially chapters 1 and 2, in a very scientific way, in a very historical way, to be able to create a narrative that this is precisely the exact steps that, by which God created everything, and this tells us how God created the cosmos, and so on and so forth, I would like us to set that conversation aside for maybe a different day, and to really look at the key messages that are revealed to us in the two creations of the creation account, in both Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. What do we discover? We discover that what the Lord is doing is that first and foremost, he is saying, I am the creator of everything. 
I'm the creator of the sun and the moon, so it makes no sense for you to worship the sun and the moon. I am the creator of the earth and the waters and the sea creatures and the animals and the trees, and so it makes no sense to worship creation, worship the creator. God makes it clear that he is the one who creates everything and that he creates everything ex nihilo. He creates everything out of nothing, meaning he alone is the one that who can create simply by bringing things into existence. He can create from nothing because he is the ultimate and infinite God and creator of all. It also makes it very clear that all of God's creation is good, that nothing that God created was evil in and of itself. It talks about how God's creation is intentional, how it is that there is purpose, there is order in the way that God creates everything. There is no chaos. There is no such thing as him creating things irrationally, but on the contrary, everything is filled with his divine rationale, his divine logos. The humanity is made by the receiving of the image and the likeness of God. So when humanity is made, man therefore receives that very image of God that we were speaking about just earlier. And humanity is an intentional creation. We're not haphazard. We're not some sort of, you know, um, accidental mutation that happened because a series uh, of small changes within cells and ultimately accidentally we came into being and we're nothing but some sort of freak mutation that was the cause of a process that has no rationale, reason or intention behind it. It also makes it very clear that humanity is the crown of a creation, that we were meant to have dominion, that we were meant to have authority, that God blessed us unlike the rest of creation, and that he handed over the keys of creation to the human being. And therefore, when he creates us, he creates us to have dominion, to subdue all of creation. Ultimately, all of this is important. Why? So that we can understand four key points for our discussion. That when we speak of our identity in God, they revolve around four very important things. The Lord created us in His image. The Lord created us in His likeness. The Lord created us with the intention of us having dominion, having authority over creation, and that ultimately He created us for life. His intention for us was never death. And this is made perfectly clear in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. So, why is any of this important? Because if we can understand these four key points, that the human being is created in God's image and likeness, and the human being was created for dominion. And the human being was created and God's honest intention and his desire for humanity was for them to live a life in eternity, to have access to immortality through him, then we will have a better understanding of knowing ourselves. Once we know ourselves, we will then have a better understanding of who it is that God is. So let's unpack some of these things, shall we? Let's talk about what it means to be created in God's image. What's beautiful is that if you take a look and what that word image actually means. In the Greek, in the original Greek, where they translated the Old Testament into Greek, in the Septuagint, it makes it clear that the word image here is the word ikona, where we get the word icon today. The word where if, if you participate in the prayers of the Orthodox Church, you'll see that we use iconography quite a bit. And the purpose of the icons is to put into imagery the very real realities of the kingdom of God. And so... Ikona here can be understood as shadow or a shade of, a, it's a depiction of what is real. And the understanding that we had from reading the Gospel of St. Matthew, where he says, render unto God what is God's, the same way that he said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, is that where the image is, the origin is also present. You have to understand this is very important. Did you know that in the Roman Empire, if they erected a, a statue or a monument for Caesar and somebody uh, disrespected, dishonored, acted irreverently towards that statue, spat on it, broke it, threw it down, whatever it may be, in doing so, that person can actually be held accountable as if he had committed that crime directly towards the emperor. In doing that to the image of the emperor, it would be the equivalent of doing it to the, to the one whose image is born in that sculpture in that monument. And so the understanding of one who bears an image is of extreme importance for us to understand that we who bear the image of God, we are ambassadors of God. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. And so because he has placed his image in us, we now reflect his authority, his power. 
even everything that he's wanted to give us. And what is this image? Well, oftentimes it is described as humanity's capacity to be rational, emotional, self-aware, creative, loving, compassionate, relational, and to possess free will. And there's so much more here that can be unpacked. But all of these things point to the total package, which we call the image of God. Now, some people might say, but there's animals in the created order that have some of these faculties. Of course, there, God has placed a little bit of himself in everything that he has created. All, all of the beauty that we see in creation is a reflection of the creator who is the essence of what it means to be beautiful. However, this total package, there's nothing else in creation that has it like the human being. Only we have this package that is called the image of God. There is no other animal that has all of these faculties so perfectly balanced and intertwined the same way that the human being does. So this image gives us insight as to who we are. What does it mean to talk about the likeness? Well, the likeness can properly be understood as our capacity in growing more and more in our potential to be like the creator who created us. And the word likeness is, is very, like it doesn't, you can understand it directly from the word itself. When I say so-and-so is like me, what I'm saying is that there is similarity there. But when we talk about the likeness of God, what we are saying is our capacity to be more and more like him who is the creator. Saint Basil, uh, the great um, the great bishop of Caesarea, archbishop of Caesarea, um, as well as the great patristic father, he talks about this idea specifically in his writings. So let's read from Saint Basil's writings on the homily of Psalm 48. What does he say? He says, and here he's quoting Genesis, and he breathed into his nostrils, the nostrils of the human being. This is to say that he placed in man some share of his own grace in order that he might recognize likeness through likeness. Nevertheless, he says, being in such great honor because he was created in the image of the creator, he is honored above the heavens, above the sun, above the choirs of the stars, for which of the heavenly bodies was said to be an image of the Most High God? What is St. Basil saying? He's saying that the Lord placed a little bit of himself in us. As a matter of fact, St. Cyril of Alexandria goes on a little bit further to explain that that breath that he breathed into the nostrils of the human being was the very breath which is the Holy Spirit of God. He placed himself within us. Why? So that in having a part of God within us, having a likeness to God within us, we might be able to recognize him as similar to us so that we want to pursue, to grow in the likeness of God. A little bit later, St. Gregory of Nyssa, in other patristic writings, he talks about how the image of God was gifted to you, something that you didn't have to work for. And so receive it as a gift, cherish it, and nourish it. But the likeness, however, is something you have to put effort into. It is a capacity that if you do not leave, if you leave it unnurtured, it will benefit you nothing. However, if you properly use the image of God that was given to you and you work towards growing in that potential and growing in the likeness of God, then you will be rewarded and crowned, says St. Gregory of Nyssa. So here we understand that both the image and the likeness tell us quite a bit about who it is that we are supposed to be as human beings created by God in his image and likeness with intention and with purpose. And what is part of that intention? Well, part of the intention was that the human being would rule over creation, not rule over it with the intention of abusing it. I don't think the Lord ever intended for us to be able to abuse creation the way that we're abusing it today, causing so much harm to creation, even causing uh, nature to rebel against us because of how much abuse we put forth towards it, how it is that we're destroying natural resources, we're abusing animals around us for the sake of consumption. There is so much that is happening around us where we are simply taking advantages of all of the beautiful resources that creation has to offer us. That is not the dominion that God intended for us. Remember that in the book of Genesis, it talked about how it is that we were intended to do what? To tend and to keep the garden, to protect it, preserve it, and make sure that it remained in healthy function. And it's said today, as you can see, because of the consumeristic reality that globally we face today, all we want to do is exploit nature. All we want to do is take advantage of creation. But this wasn't God's intention for us. Today, what we want to realize is that when God created us to subdue, 
to have dominion, to have authority over creation, his intention for us was to realize that we are the pinnacle of creation, that if we fail at our task, all of creation suffers. Where do we see it clearly? That the Lord desired for us to have dominion. We see it in the fact that the Lord hands over to us what he created and should have only belonged to him. But he takes what naturally belongs to him and he hands it over to us. Let's read from Genesis chapter 2. A really beautiful passage that if you understand properly, you'll have some really interesting insight as to God's desire for us to be blessed, to have dominion, to subdue all of creation. It says in Genesis chapter 2, Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air. And he brought them all to Adam. So he brought them all to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Why, why is this even a relevant passage to what we're discussing? Who gets to name the animal that you buy to become your pet? Let's say you buy a pet dog. and You bring that puppy home. Is it your neighbor who gets to name the puppy? Of course not. Is it a distant relative? Is it your uncle uh, in the Middle East who gets to name your puppy? Of course not. Who gets to name the dog? You do. Why? Speaking of dog, I hope you didn't hear that barking too loud. I apologize. Um, who gets to name the dog? You do. Why? Because that dog is yours. That dog is yours. And you, as the master and the owner and the responsible for that dog, you get to name it. We can say the same thing about our children. Who gets to name our children? Whom we bear. The mother who bears that child in her womb for nine months and then rejoices over the arrival of that baby. The nurse or the doctor who get to name it? That baby is named by the parents, the ones who gave it life. The Lord here, what does he do? He takes creation that he has created and he hands it over to Adam and he says, it was for you to begin with. It was never for me. I neither increase nor decrease based on what's created or not created. I am unchanging, Adam. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. When I create, it's for the sake of goodness only. So I give to you the gifts of my creation. You name them. Why? Because they are going to be subject to you. I have put my image on you. You bear my authority. This is such a beautiful passage to reflect to us what God's intention was for us. But instead of us having dominion over creation, what do we see today? The human being being dominated by all of creation. What do we mean by being dominated? Not that we don't have authority or power and that we're not the smartest of all creatures. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we were never meant to be slaves to material things, to created order. But instead today, things as simple as, forgive me, these God-forsaken devices, right? These phones, right? Well, they are very useful and they help us communicate and they make sure that we stay in touch and they help us stay organized. And now we can capture moments through the camera and the video in beautiful ways. And we can even connect with each other in this way, even here while recording this podcast. It's wonderful. But how many of us are slaves to our devices? How many are slaves to our stomachs in the sin of gluttony, in the passion of gluttony? How many of us are slaves to substances? How many people have you seen who are addicted and a slave to cigarettes, to marijuana, to alcohol? We were never meant to be slaves to any part of creation. A human being was always meant to be the one who is free in Christ. The one who lives a life that is not in bondage. We were created to have dominion and not to be dominated by any form of creation or slavery or death. The last thing that we said is that we were created by God to be fully alive. And according to St. Irenaeus, and this is a very beautiful and popular passage that says the glory of God is what? Man fully alive. Fully alive. The Lord never meant for us to be slaves. To be in bondage, he never created us with the intention of us being subject to death or corruption. The Lord never intended for us to participate in anything other than his eternity, which he has created for us, and his life, which is one that is immortal and undying. He does not want us to be anything but immortal and undying. Because in sharing in the life of the Trinity, the human being had the capacity to be able to choose eternity and immortality. Now, we've seen all of this. And why is all of this important? Because if we now take a step back and realize I'm created in his image, which is a gift that I don't deserve, and he has given me all of these beautiful faculties to point back to him. He has created me in his likeness so I can pursue a life where I go back to wanting to be more and more like my creator. 
He has created me so that I may have dominion. He's given me authority and power. And finally, he's created me to be fully alive, to pursue eternity and a life of immortality in him. All of this tells me who I am supposed to be and how all of these things share or at the very least give me insight into my identity. And when we talk specifically about being fully alive, you have to remember that this is the desire of the Lord. It says in the Gospel of St. John that the Lord says himself, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it what more abundantly. Not just life where you have a heartbeat and your lungs are functioning and you seem relatively healthy. No, a life that is full and more abundant than we can possibly imagine. Meaning what? A life that is shared in him who is life himself. And nothing less than that. He desires so much more for us than simply to exist. He wants us to be fully alive. And while being fully alive, it makes no sense for us to live this life if we do not know ourselves and in the process do not know Him. And the knowledge of Him is what will grant us access to that eternal life. You see, I think the point that the church has been trying to make to us for the longest time is that if you take the time to investigate who God created you to be, you will then know who you are. And in the process of doing that search, going through the journey of identifying who you are, you will know something about God and His desire for you and His heart that is inclined towards you. In the Gospel of St. John chapter 17, we know that the Lord, in His last moments of agony, right before He is betrayed and handed over to be um, handed over to be unrighteously judged and then eventually crucified on Friday, on that Thursday evening, he is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we read from his prayer in John chapter 17, where he reveals to us what it means to truly know God. We read the following. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And then he makes it extremely clear. He says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What does it mean to say that eternal life is knowledge? Well, clearly here he's not talking about head knowledge. He's not talking about simply data that we have stored in our minds intellectually, but rather he's talking about that knowledge that is intimate, a knowledge where there is a sharing of relationship so that we can be very clear that there is no way for us to participate in eternal life outside of relationship with Him. And you cannot be in relationship with Him if you do not know Him intimately. And I think what is being implied today ultimately in the discussion that we're having, there is no knowing Him intimately unless you take the time to know who He created you to be. Know your identity. Know who you are in God. And this will point you to understanding who God is and His intention for you. Only then can we know Him and then share in that eternal life that He's created for us to share in. And all of this ultimately points to what? That He does all of these things so that in knowing Him, we may have real relationship, real intimacy with the one true God. Let's read together from the book of Philippians what St. Paul says on this matter. He says, But what things were gained to me? These I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And again, knowledge here is not what? It's not head knowledge. It wasn't enough for Paul to hear what the apostles had to say. It's his encounter with Christ. It's when the Lord revealed himself to him. And he continued to know him and pursue him and to grow in that likeness of God. That is the knowledge that he refers to here, not simply head knowledge. Count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may what, and this is, this is the key passage here, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection 
from the dead. All of this, why Paul? Why did you undergo all of this? Why did you endure all of this suffering that I may know him and the power of his resurrection? Everything points back to my desire to know God. And in knowing him, I will have eternal life. You see, this is where it's so important for us to ask the question. Can I know God without knowing who he created me to be? No. Can I know who he created to me to be without approaching him? No. So we find ourselves in this dilemma. I want to know God and I want him to define my identity, but I can't truly know him unless I know who he's created me to be. And this is where the church is teaching us. Learn to know yourself, his intention for you, his desire for you, the gift that he has given you, and then you will know who you are. So here we are again. We ask the question, who am I? Who am I? And this is where the answer has to come back to those four points that we discussed earlier. I am a human being created in God's image, created in God's likeness, with the intention and the desire for me to have dominion and not be a slave or in bondage to anything, and that I may have life in Christ Jesus, my Lord. This defines the parameters of my identity. This defines the parameters of who I am supposed to be. My uniqueness is found in these four foundational elements. If I can embrace these four elements, these very key points, then the Lord will be able to allow me to discover who He is in greater detail. And when I know Him in greater detail, in great relationship, with intimacy and with love, in real relationship with Him, then I will be able to discover what it means for me to be uniquely created in Him and by Him. And maybe this is where we will also discover my purpose, my calling, the vocation that He has set out for me. I will end by sharing with you very briefly yet again another quote from St. Anthony the Great, the same one who we opened up with, we will close this conversation with. He makes it clear, one who knows oneself knows God, and one who knows God is worthy to worship him as is right. Therefore, my beloved, in the Lord, know yourselves. In the Lord, know yourselves. My beloved, I think ultimately, what all of us are called to realize is that our hope is that we can reach a point where ultimately we get to know ourselves so that in knowing ourselves, we may get to know the Lord our God who loves us and created us to be with him and in him in all things. May the Lord grant you and me to be able to go on that journey of being able to know ourselves, understanding those foundational elements that will teach us exactly what God's desire is for every single one of us. As human beings created in His image and likeness, as human beings we created to have dominion and not to be in bondage or slavery, and as human beings that He intended for us to be fully alive. May God grant you success in that journey and grant it to all of us who pursue Him and desire relationship with Him. My beloved, again, I will remind you, if you believe that anyone who has, um, has questions about the faith, is desiring to know more, if you believe that any of them can benefit, anyone can benefit from what it is that we're discussing, please feel free to share this with those who can benefit. And until we see each other again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And to God be all glory, now and forever, and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.